Hello. My name is Erin. I'm assuming I'm in the right room. Um, I, uh, I work at Red Hat. I've been at Red Hat almost three years. I worked at uh, IBM for a cool 21, which is a long time. Um, I'm a Java champion, a distinguished engineer, and the defining characteristic of me is I build really ridiculous things, which is most of what we're going to talk about today is really ludicrous stuff. This is my daughter, who's nine, and I wanted to show her, like, here's where I'm talking, and my daughter at nine years old already knows excellent use of, excellent use of GIFs. I was really proud of her. GIFs, your preference of pronunciation. Um, that's her encouragement for me. Okay. So I want to go beyond rest and crud, and I wanted to bring this up. Last week I was at QCon, and uh, Adrian Cockroft came and did a keynote there. And one of the things he talked about was, <laughs> the premise of his talk was lesson lear lessons learned at Netflix. Who, who remembers like all of the Netflix OSS libraries that came out, how we all started learning about microservices with the Netflix stuff. And what was interesting as he was giving his talk was, how much he emphasized what we did not learn with microservices, how much we do wrong still. Um, how many of you have been around the block a few times in this industry? How many of you have noticed we keep kind of coming back to the same premises, right? So uh, Kelsey Hightower just had his, had a blog post recently about a monolithic deployment that would go to microservices after you push the button. We're back to Corba, right? That's where, that's where we are, we're back there. Um, so with microservices, who else, like this is a drawing I did in 20 something for a, for a book that I wrote. And the general idea was you're supposed to take your microservices, break them up into million pieces. Why? It was supposed to be rate of pace, rate of delivery, faster time to have like your new stuff out there, right? Um, also, my pet peeve is now how we draw that, that right side, right? Because it wasn't ever actually simple, was it? You had the web tier, the data tier. It was the layer cake with all the doodads and the whiz bangs. The only thing that was the problem with that right side, it was a monolithic deployment, which is exactly where we are now with our messy Helm charts. <laughs> just say we, we didn't actually go anywhere. We just have a lot more pieces now to deal with. Everybody knows the 12 factors? Okay, we're going to talk a little bit about practices and patterns today. Is it on? It went off again. It is off. There it is. It's on. All right, I did push the button. So anyway, where did the 12 factors come from? Did they come like, you know, spring fully formed like Athena? No. <laughs> uh, as with a lot of patterns we talk about, they were emergent. Uh, the guys from Heroku put out the 12 factors, and that was after they saw the kinds of applications that were successful being deployed to the PaaS and those that were not. And they said, of the ones that were successful, here's the characteristics that they have in common. And I remember when I was talking to customers at that time, part of what I wanted to say is, if you net those out, there's a couple things that are super important if you want to get this right. Having everything, like each one of these little services be autonomous was a big part of it. Having it be portable so it could go across environments, make sure all your dependencies are injected, all that stuff, that's important. Having, being, like making sure it can be disposed of is important. That was unheard of when you had like your big web sphere, because of course I was IBM at the time, right? That thing never went away. So um, this is turning on and off. It's gonna be a fight, I can just tell. Um, so having that concept of having a, a process that you spin up and then having it go away again, like the scale out people could get. The scale back was like, wait, what? <laughs> um, and so that was, that was a big deal. But the thing that people missed, and this was Adrian's point, was that people don't understand how to make all these pieces be truly independent. Everybody knows what a two pizza team is. But we can't seem, this is going to turn off again, but we can't seem to figure out how to allow these teams to actually create their applications, deploy their applications. Adrian's point was like, at Netflix, anybody could roll anything out to production at any time. Do you know why? No traffic would go there. It was totally safe. We could put it out there and then gradually get traffic to that that instance, right? And you could kind of do the canary rollout, make sure it was okay. And if it wasn't, you'd back it off and throw it away and everything was fine. We still don't understand that. Never got there. And um, 
when we were writing all this stuff way back, uh, again, builder of ridiculous things, we made a text-based adventure game. This thing is probably still alive, maybe. Um, I don't know. And uh, I wanted to show you this only because we started with a really small concept. And as we kept going, it kind of kept growing. And this was just us messing around, right? We were, just, we were just building something to show people microservices concepts. But this thing evolved, and it moved, and we added things, and we took away things, and we added Kafka, and we did amalgamate. You have to adapt to survive. So the question is, how do you build your apps so that they can adapt, right? How do you make these pieces independent? Also, in our industry, we almost never have a clean slate, do we? How many times in your career have you started with a green field? <laughs> like, for real, not very often, maybe like twice. Most of the time you have like this old stuff that you can't get rid of, and so you end up with like this hodgepodge of some new and some old and some in between and some we don't even know because we don't know where the source code is anymore. Um, so the key for this is to decouple the, like you, you get this, right? This is not a new problem. You need to decouple the pieces of your system so that they can evolve independently, which was theoretically the point of microservices to begin with, which we still have never managed to do. Um, and when we talk about this space, we're talking about systems integration. Who has actually ever done something where they use systems integration in a sentence? How many of you write apps instead? How many of you are like me and did everything in the box of the app server? That's me. I'm an app server writer. Um, this is a different perspective where we're trying to think about message routing. Instead of thinking about the boxes, you're thinking about the spaghetti. Like, how does this stuff go in between the places? And it really is a like you turn your head kind of sideways to understand how to build this stuff. Who has seen this book before? Or heard of this before, so I messed with my microphone again. Enterprise Integration, this book is 20 years old. You wanna know something? It's still absolutely accurate. So if you take one thing away, the Gang of Four Design Patterns book, this Design Pattern book, 12 Factor Apps, why are those relevant still? because they're not telling us what to do, they're telling us what we already always do. These are the patterns, this is the language, this is how we explain what we're doing and articulate what we're doing, and it maybe might refine some of our ideas about what we can do, because guess what, we've solved these problems a billion and 12 times before. And we don't need to keep starting from scratch. I have a feeling the battery on this thing is dead. Anyway, um, okay, so I'm actually secretly gonna talk to you about Camel. Who's heard about Camel? Camel is old as dirt but it's also new, like everything old is new again. Um, Camel has some really fun things. Part of what it does is it allows you to bring enterprise integration patterns into your app in a very obvious way. I am going to do ridiculous things with it because that's what I do. So we're not actually gonna do Kubernetes. We're not actually gonna do Kafka. We're not gonna do JMS, because guess what? The internet will tell you how to do that. We're gonna do other random stuff. Um, Camel is secretly an acronym, did you know that? I think the name came before the acronym. I think it's one of those games where it's like, we wanna use this name and we're gonna figure out what acronym is cool. Um, there are, there's some language that we choose uh, when we're talking about Camel because again, we're talking about all these gluey bits in between. So they have some vocabulary that they use. They're almost always talking about messages. And that's the data in flight. They talk about exchanges, which is a little bit more about how you're, a little more context around how that message is flowing. Um, it holds, uh, just more ancillary data, it travels end to end as you go through the route. Can you guys hear me? Because this microphone is turning on and off and I'm about ready to be done fighting with it. Okay, good, in the back, we're good. Um, endpoints you almost never get your hands directly on, right, but that's your receiver and your sender. The component is what knows how to do things. So if you want support for REST, it's a component that's gonna tell you how to do that. If you want support for FTP, it's a component that's gonna do that. It creates the endpoints, which then know how to do the protocol things, right? Um, and then we have processors, which is how you, like a lighter weight kind of thing, how you inject your custom logic, right, into, into the route. Okay, last year I wrote a ridiculous app, because again, I like writing ridiculous apps, that was a command line application for Dungeons and Dragons inventory management, because I play games with my sister. Um, I'm part of a community of people that use, I don't know if any of you have heard of Obsidian, it's a note-taking app, it's a little obsessive. And there's a whole bunch of us that use it 
uh, as dungeon masters to take notes. And then I have a whole bunch of friends in that community who also use it to play their games. And the biggest complaint we have as players or DMs is like, okay, everybody has stuff in their pockets. What do we have in our pockets again? And can we share pockets? Like, because we have some shared inventory because all of us have a bag of holding that we're shoving everything in. And I don't know, do you remember what's in there? I don't remember what's in there. And most of the web tools, they don't do a great job of explaining what any of this is. So my plan, my grand plan, I've got a UI now because it's complicated. I've got a command line because that's where I started and that's a good place to start. And I've got a shared database that I want to sort. Oh, and by the way, this is all on the cheap. I'm writing this for people who don't understand computers. So there's no, there's no web services. There's no starting a container. There's no starting Kubernetes. There's no, like, I just have to have it all in process. They push the button or they, do, you know, and then that's it. And it, it's just simple. So that's the rules. So I've got this shared data store. I want both the UI and the CLI to be able to do things to the data. I want the response, of course, to be able to go appropriately back either with a nice CLI display in the terminal or a nice web UI display up top. And then, oh, maybe I can do JSON log because that's a way I could start sharing this with my friends. Here's all the events that we changed to the pockets and if it's a single line, right, I can start aggregating these and sharing them across. I also want markdown notes because that makes me happy. So I wanna admit some markdown files, makes sense. Um, and then I wanna leave room for, I don't know, Whatever they else, whatever else the community decides. A couple ideas I have is Google Sheets, going to Git. Um, oh gosh, there's at least, Camel can do everything, right? Everybody knows Camel can be used to do go anything to anywhere. Um, so that's my plan. How many of you have written a REST endpoint that looks like that? Yeah, there should be all the hands up. This is how REST looks. So <laughs> this is just what it is. But this is what's funny, right? So we have at the top, we have a path. We have our path, right? And I have some path parameters because I have profiles now. I made my life complicated for no good reason. Um, okay, this is one endpoint, right? Okay, the next chart has some animation. You're gonna have to watch it. But I want you to let it sink in because this is where things go sideways. I wanna make sure everybody is aware, if I like writing rest this way, Camel will let me write rest this way. It's not opinionated. I could do it either way, which uh, is somebody that's learning it. It's like, wait, what? You mean I could do it? E well, which is the right way? <laughs> if you're a test taker and you want the right answer, Camel does not help you. You could do whatever you want. So this is animating because I can do a lot of rest endpoints, the whole set of rest endpoints in a couple lines, right? This is, this is really easy. And you can still read it. I know it's going a little fast. I'm gonna let it bounce up and down like a beach ball a couple times. But I'm doing a lot of definition all very concisely. You can see what these are, right? Everybody can see what the, can you guys see in the back okay? Okay. Um, the important thing to note for our conversation is, is um, the direct endpoints. I don't know if any of you had church going grandmothers, but my mother, my grandmother used to do this thing where she put her hands together. She'd go, here's the church, here's the steeple, open it up and you see all the people. So that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna use a lot of direct endpoints inside this one process so I could talk to you about camel things. But anywhere in here where it says direct set config, that's point to point inside, you could replace that with JMS and it'll go out or another rest endpoint and it would go out. So the fact that I'm talking about everything in a process does not put any limits. All the same principles apply and you could go between. So I'm just, I'm giving myself a little bit of simplicity in terms of what I'm setting up. All right, so this is a specific, this is a domain specific language for REST. You can see it gives you very RESTy verbs. The REST component to go into, um, to go into camel terms, right, is what's providing this function. Are you gonna listen to me? Okay, so in the center up here, these two yellow boxes, this is very typical enterprise integration pattern drawing. Um, Again, for me, I'm usually in one yellow box or the other. I'm either the requester or the replier. Um, this is, from an enterprise integration pattern sense, when you're using REST, it is request response. And so from a drawing perspective, what I want you to know is that that part on the furthest left, that REST, is getting the request. 
it's actually the same over here on the right that's returning the response. It knows, I'm just gonna try to do this left to right so you can see the data transformation. Um, it knows that by the time this route ends, whatever is left in the message is what's gonna go back to the requester. So it's gonna do that part. So I just want you to know the sandwich, those are actually the same thing. That's the REST component, knowing how REST is supposed to behave. All right, so out of all of that bouncing list of REST declarations, I'm gonna focus on that bottom one. I've used a direct endpoint that's got a very verbose Java style name. Validate and modify pockets. It's very descriptive. Um, all right, so we're gonna go through a more detailed description of what this does. So. I'm defining my direct endpoint, I'm getting a from. That means anything that's, that's, this is what's really weird when you talk about it. It's a from, which means I'm catching anything that goes to. It's like, meh. but anyway. <laughs> anyway, so here's, I'm receiving anything going to validate and modify pockets. I'm setting up some auto start, I'm like disabling auto startup, because remember I've got two modes that I wanna run this thing in. I wanna run it as a command line, one and done or I'm gonna let this web UI run, and I'm showing you the web UI path first. So I'm, there's some, some stuff I have that doesn't start on purpose. Because I don't know what I'm doing, the first thing I do is I put a log at either end, right? Because I don't know what I'm doing. So we want it to be self-explanatory. You'll see that has another URI, log, and then the component, and then, right? So everything in Camel is structured as URIs like this. There's part of me that really hates this. I'm like, what do you mean you use strings? All you do is typo all the time. Like, how does that work? but it's like normal, that's how Camel works. Because I could do all of this in JSON, or in YAML, by the way, or in XML if I wanted to. So the, all of this string matching is for a reason. And it's because there's alternate DSLs that you can use to also glue things together. Um, then I have this process thing, that's where the question mark is. I'm gonna validate what the profile is, because remember that was a, that was a path parameter. Um, what that looks like, I, have a, it, I actually have this as transactional. I'm going against the database and I'm making sure that the profile that someone specified matches one that's defined. I have some things, well, you could be a little loosey-goosey about which one it is and I'll find the right one and then I'll set it and everything will be great. So that's what that one does. But you'll see I'm taking the message, looking at a header attribute and putting it back on the message. So I'm enriching the message as I go. You kind of transform the message in place, if you will. Then I call this modify pockets method. Now, this is inside. I'm taking the request, I'm doing some stuff to it. We don't care, actually, from the purposes of this talk, we don't care what it is that I'm doing, but I get a response out at the end. This, if, if I were looking at this from a microservices perspective, that would be the other application elsewhere, right? It just happens to be in the middle. So this is the common stuff. I'm doing things against the database. I have a little bit of a router here that I'm gonna show you. For this part, I'm pulling the body and the header profile um, from that, and you can see this is where I'm taking the, this request object. I'm using a request object that I defined because I want the CLI and the web UI to behave the same. Doing some things, I'm returning the response. In this case right here, I'm starting the transaction, and I'm adding the profile onto a context that's gonna last for the duration of the transaction, so I have it. And then, this is the sneaky part, that wiretap came in. That's my fork where I'm gonna go do a bunch of other stuff. We will talk about what that other stuff is later. Wiretap is an enterprise integration pattern. It is effectively a fork in the path. After that, I've gotten to the log, I've gotten to the end, the response goes back. So from the client's perspective, my web UI client's perspective, I've gotten the response and that's done. If I look at it from the CLI perspective, it's kind of the same. Um, I have a delegation pattern here. If, uh, I don't know if any of you um, have tried writing a Pico CLI command line. The biggest difference when you're writing a command line is you don't have that web container or EJB container semantic of here's when your request starts. So I have to do it. I have to say here's where my request starts. That's line two and line three. I'm gonna start the request. I'm gonna start, the, I'm gonna indicate that this is transactional. Um, I have to do basically what the web UI pulled as a path parameter. I have to figure that out now, set that up. Um, and I have a delegation call because that just makes my life easier. Um, and so if I go into a create flow, I'm gonna create that modification. I'm gonna put it in a modification request and I'm gonna call in line 11, this modify pockets. And that goes to this kind of thing. So there's a couple different ways to invoke camel routes directly. Here's one of them. So if you look between like line six and 11, I've created an interface, real cheap interface. It doesn't do anything, it's not attached to anything. The important part is actually line 10. 
So line 10 takes that interface and it attaches it to a string endpoint. So that way when I invoke that method, it knows, oh, that method is going to that direct endpoint, which is gonna kick off that whole route. That's how that works. So if I draw this route similar to the other one, right, to try to give you a parallel idea, the direct endpoint on either end, it's gonna know because of the signature that this is also request response. So it will take care of sending the response, uh, you know, sending the response um, when the pipe is done. Again, I add my, log, my logs because I don't know what the hell I'm doing. So that's always important. Um, then modify pockets in this case actually go sooner and I could pass in, but this is like me actually calling that inner bean much more directly in this case than I was able to from the website. I actually have to set the profile afterwards. I have to set it into the context afterwards. And that's just a little bit of a difference um, in behavior between the two paths. Um, so I'm just, I'm adding it to the body again. I'm just augmenting the message as I go. And here's the wiretap. Now what's interesting with these, they are almost the same. The important part for me is that the invocation of modify pockets is identical. The in and out is identical. The wiretap is identical. The rest, there's a little bit of semantic difference, but I did not have to change a lot of code to, to account for those differences. It's the, these these um, route definitions are very, very similar. So it's very easy for me to understand what on earth just happened with that. Okay, so if we look at what the wiretap does, this is another pattern. We're gonna do another route. We're gonna kick off another route. So this is, we've gone down the T, it's common from both paths from here down. Um, I'm gonna have an emit handler. I'm gonna, I use a lot of beans for this. It's, I transition between doing the routes and doing the beans. Um, again, that's just how, how I work. So when I look at the, 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 this handler, the first thing I'm gonna do, this is another integration pattern called a recipient list. And in this case, what I'm doing is I'm checking against the configuration of the pocket for the, you know, the, which profile. So do you have JSON logging, do you have JSON logs turned on or not? Do you have markdown files turned on or not? I can't imagine in my future, do you have Google Sheets turned on or not? Do you have GitHub turned on or not? Because I'll need credentials and other things um, in order to have those happen. So for every one of those things that's turned on, you can see on line 17, I smoosh them all together with a comma in between. Real advanced, but it's comma separated list, right? And so then what happens is that whole little comma separated list that's in that route header, the routes header, uh, Camel is gonna take this exchange and it's gonna give it to all of them. Furthermore, because of line five, it's going to do it in parallel. Wow, that was not a lot of lines of code and it's gonna do all of that magic for me, that's amazing. Um, so if we look at a JSON emitter from that, this is, pretty, this is pretty easy stuff, really. I'm taking a header, I've got that profile in the header, I'm using that to set a file name. That's on line seven. I'm setting the body. Now, so this is, I got this rich message in. On this path, unlike, I have to do a little bit of backup. In that web UI path, I'm using REST. It's very easy for me to tell Quarkus, also use Jackson. So it wasn't super obvious that Jackson was in the way making JSON go back and forth over the request things. I am not on the REST path anymore. I'm outside of the REST component. So right here on line 10, I have to do this, I have to make it explicit. I'm going to change your object. I'm going to stringify it as JSON. I have to do that myself because there's no, there's no REST semantic that says actually apply a Jackson transformation to this so it goes out as JSON. So I have to do that. So that's what happens on line 10. Line 12, this is a standard, a pretty straightforward camel component that knows how to write to files. It's just another URL. Um, I'm giving it a, you can see there's a two with a D, that means dynamic. That means it's gonna change at runtime, you can't pre-know this thing, you're gonna have to like cobble together with some simple grammar what the value of this directory is at runtime because I could change it per profile, right? So. We're gonna do this and we're gonna append. You're gonna use a backslash n so it gets to the next line and if it's not there already, you're gonna create it. Everything's great. That was super easy. Um, now, markdown emitter gets a little complicated. Um, I did some fun things with this. So I'll show you the simple parts and then we'll look at the code parts and then you guys can ask me questions because I'll be done. So with the markdown emitter, 
I have some exceptions. I actually haven't gone through. You may have seen them pop up several times. Um, I have exceptions there because I want to give good feedback to my users, and I've got them in two different paths, so that's what that top part is. Um, that beam that I'm emitting, again, I'm passing the body and I'm passing that profile to a beam that understands how to emit these markdown files, and I've got my logs for sanity. That log is going to go do a bunch of things. We will go over what that, go, what that does in a minute. But it comes back to use Qt. Who has used Qt? Qt is a super adorable templating language that comes with Quarkus, and I actually love it a lot. I abuse it horribly. <laughs> you can come talk to me later. I do some ridiculous things. Um, but you can see this is another direct endpoint. And what I'm telling it on line seven is, here, Qt, I'm going to give you a dummy path for now because I want you to look at the header to tell you which template it is. So you're going to get the template from the header. That's true. So that's why I'm giving you a dummy file name there. And then on line nine, it's another two dynamic. I want you to write this file. I want you to render this cute template to that directory. And then if, you know, just overwrite it because with these markdown templates, I'm always coming from scratch. I'm not appending. It's a whole full on replace. And if it's a null body, just create a new file and that's great. Um, so the tricky part with this, and the reason I wanted to do it uh, this way, is because um, this, is, uh, this is a lot. So when I come in here to emit the markdown file, I've got my little mark, my, is this big enough? Can you see it? It's bigger? That bigger? Better? Okay, good. I hate this theme, but it, whatever, it's fine. Um, so, you can see a couple things here. I've got more configuration bits because I know my users who use Markdown are going to be super persnickety about what it looks like, so I've got to let them pimp their ride, basically, right? They've got to be able to do all the things. And I've got, um, so I'm collecting information. Journals are like records of what changed. I want to look at all the items that are there and all the pockets that are there and where all the money is and how much of that there is. And then I get to templates, and this is where Quarkus is amazing. So I can pull up a template, I add the data that that template needs, and here is camel magic. So this is the other way for me to invoke a camel template. So I showed you before the interface style way that doesn't use camel, camel APIs. Um, this producer template does. And so like I have that injected up here. It's a very simple inject of the producer template. And when I invoke it here, you can see I'm telling it what URI to use, what endpoint URI to use, and then I'm passing it an exchange. Um, and I create that exchange. The one thing that bothers me is I need to do this URI twice. Theoretically, I, was, I should be smart and have that as a constant, but I'm not smart, and I just wrote it twice because I don't know why. So um, I got that, but you can see I'm also setting headers that cute the camel support for Qt needs, like what the file name should be when it's writing it, and I actually set on the, on, as a header an arbitrary object, which is the template instance itself. So I'm passing, I'm passing that in. Um, and so I do that for an event log, I do that for an inventory, and I do that for all the pockets. Um, and if I show, I could run it again, or I could just show you. How am I doing on time anyway? I have no idea. I think we're good. Did I go too fast? Who the hell knows? What? I'm halfway? Well, I went really fast, so I'm almost done, which is great. You guys can ask me questions, and we can go poke around. That's way funner anyway. So um, if I just go through the logs a little bit at a time, you can see I'm got, I've got my base command that's happening. I'm pulling the profile. I'm launching with the profile set. I've got presets that I'm pulling. Here's where I have that first request coming in. Here I've finished processing the request. Here is where I have my response. You can see the response type is the modification response right here. Here's where I have an exchange. Um, this is in the first part of the wiretap. And you can see the threads starting to intermingle now. So I've got the wiretap starting. And at the same time, here's what comes out to the console. Here's the item that was created. I'm also at the other thread loading the CLI item template. 
I can see what my item was. There's a note about it. There's the weight, the value, whether or not it's tradable and what pockets it's in. That all comes out uh, as CLI output. Um, and then I'm gonna start, you can start seeing that I'm emitting results here. So I emit, emit results for um, the JSON log. You could start seeing I have, um, this is the next exchange in the recipient list. So you could start to see recipient list coming out. There's one, there's two, there's three, there's four, right? So it, like all this stuff is happening and I didn't, I didn't have to do all that much to make that happen. I can add additional things later. If I show you what that looks like, I have a few things that come out for that profile. So my JSON log has that one event, right? So that's the serialized event of that response. And when I have those interactions happening, I'm actually keeping track of the item being created um, and then being removed and added to pockets at the same time. I have an event log, which ends up being a table format which is gonna show up within the markdown. If I show you the preview. It's a little nicer to read, right? So I have a, a markdown view of the events. Some of these come from Dev Services and Corcus, by the way. So it's reading from import X, uh, SQL. So the um, event log has a few more events than my test uh, created. My test only created these last few lines. Um, I have an inventory view. I'll put that over here and crack open this inventory view shows what people have in their pockets, how much currency there is, what items there are. Um, they can look at any individual backpack thing. So that's all the stuff that the templates put together. And I chained all of that together with, a, with a, not a lot of code. Um, there was a frightening amount of code writing for not a lot actually necessary, uh, if I'm honest. Um, and this is what that command line looks like. There's a, you just put a pretend pockets up here. Corcus uh, has a lot of nice utilities for running tests for your command line applications, which I thoroughly enjoy abusing. Um, I did go super fast, which is not unusual for me. So I would love questions and we can go poke at code or look at more things or unbox whatever. Um, ask me, yes. So, interestingly, it's not a lot different. Um, Camel has been around for a long time. I think you could see some of those. I think you can do some of what Camel does in a lot of different ways and put it in your service meshes. Some of it, um, if you look at what some low level routers do, um, and I know people are looking at trans tran some transformation at the service mesh layer out of Lua and other things, you could do it at that level also. Um, but this you can do within normal Java. They have camelets, by the way. So we can do this in Kubernetes very, in a very lightweight way um, between camelets and JBang. So it's an alternate way to do it. They're not, it's different because it's in Java or in XML or in YAML. Um, so it's just an alternate. It's very lightweight too. For all I know, the stuff that you're using elsewhere is actually using YAML under the covers. There's a very good possibility that that's true. What other questions? Come on. What? Yes, uh, absolutely. Um, well, right now it's on a branch. Um, but it's, it's Pocket CLI. It's very imaginatively named um, because that's, that's how I roll. But yes, everything of mine is, is always, always on GitHub. Um, and you're gonna have to watch, this is the main branch, which is the old version. Uh, I forget what I called this branch. It's something really obvious like simplified, which is totally not what this is. <laughs> totally not what this is. Because um, it, I made a catastrophe disaster. Um, it's it's gonna be pretty great though. Um, but I am looking forward to adding these additional things. Um, I don't know if you guys have looked at the Like here's the enterprise integration patterns for Apache Camel. 
I didn't want to necessarily go through all of these in a lecture style because uh, it gets kind of boring. So I wanted to use one. I just wanted to show it in use um, and hopefully get you guys interested to look at it for other things. The most interesting thing to me about Camel is that I don't just have to use it in an enterprise context. You could do this any file transformation you wanted to do ever. If you have a pile of JSON that you suddenly want to be YAML and you want to use Jackson to do it because you know Jackson, guess what will work? It'll hoover in your whole directory of files, spit out a whole directory of files, and it will use Jackson, which you already know how to use, and you'll have everything translated. And it was like, oh, that was, that was easy. So if you want your easy button, you have an easy button. Um, but it, again, it covers all of that. If we look at uh, other camel components, I didn't try to go through uh, the core components or other components because literally it is everything, everything, everything. Anything to anything, anywhere, everywhere, all the time. Keep on going forever. Um, and all the, <laughs> I know really, it's all there. So ha have, have, like, have you guys used Camel before? Yeah? I want you all to come in after and tell me if I'm wrong. You did? Yeah, I did. My, my company, we are using that to monitor or doing management of all these tracking or getting this. For example, like getting the file, file to proceed. Yeah. Loading or like getting the REST API from our source. Or that said, recently we use that a lot. But sometimes the raw my Yes, uh, one thing I found out if I if I, I copy and paste the the rest API link into the wrong the prompt, it will cause error. Yeah, so that's my my one reservation that I've, the one thing that bothers me about Camel is is the way the URLs are constructed and the fact that you can do it several ways. So you can get yourself into trouble sometimes with your URI construction, because um, there's, there's a lot of options, too. Um, so if you want to show me later, we could try to sort it out. Um, but I think, minimally, I hope what you got out of this talk is that it is really powerful glue. It's the epoxy you didn't know you needed, contact cement, all the gluey pieces, all the bubble gum, all the sticky tape. Um, with that, I think I will call it done and give you guys some more time. Thank you.